Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Years of deadlock in Israeli-Palestinian peace efforts, with bursts of violence and notions of despair dissuading optimism for any sparks of a viable solution to ignite sentiments of a better future, the Palestinian leadership resorted to its strongest supporters within the international community, seeking to assert legal mechanisms that will turn the tide in their battle for statehood. To discuss their attempts to apply international mechanisms to assert their demands on Israel, I'm joined here in the studio by Dr. Hili Modric Evenchen, who is a lecturer at the Academic Center for Law and Science in Hoda Sharon. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Ms. Paula Sleer, who is a Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the latest developments specifically on this topic. The Arab-Israeli conflict, which is a broader one than the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, has always been conducted within the context of international organizations. The um, uh, State of Israel having been established uh, per a UN General Assembly resolution, and then many of the uh, uh, campaigns and operations uh, being measured through UN Security Council resolutions. There is also the International Criminal Court, the uh, IAEA regarding nuclear issues and the like. The Palestinian issue came to the fore in 1974 after the Yom Kippur War when uh, the Arab League decided that the Palestinian Liberation Organization is the representative of the Palestinians rather than the Kingdom of Jordan, which is a UN member. So from that point on, uh, in various uh, stages, we have seen the Palestinian entity under uh, several names trying to sneak its way into international fora. And uh, the governing notion for the Palestinians is that they are the weaker party in their conflict with Israel. And therefore, in order to balance the, uh, the force ratio, they need international support, therefore they go to international organizations. Dr. Mudrik Evenchen, considering the fact that the Palestinian Authority is recognized as a non-observer state within the United Nations General Assembly, uh, nevertheless is not an actual state uh, by definition, how can such an uh, entity or uh, an organization, if you will, bring about its assertion on various mechanisms and actually sign statutes and uh, uh, different treaties that uh, need to be signed by only member states? Not only member states, only states. So we must uh, make this uh, difference between the UN and other uh, forms uh, in which the Palestinians can uh, gain the status of a state. That is, if states are willing to let them uh, become parties to some uh, treaty or convention, then they consider uh, the, the Palestinian Authority as a state. And this is, in fact, the situation. Uh, where the Palestinian Authority becomes a member of, uh, of different uh, uh, treaties and it also becomes a member of dif different organizations such as UNESCO, for example. And perhaps more importantly, they are uh, members of the Rome Statute, the Statute of the International Criminal Court, which in fact um, um, acknowledged them as a state, I mean the, the authority as a state. And, uh, and this is a major um, uh, development mm. uh, regarding uh, its status. And, 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 and it is uh, only, um, uh, I mean, we can assume that they soon will become uh, perhaps UN members, but maybe not in the current US administration. Well, we'll touch base on this more considering the fact that there is here some kind of a contrast considering the fact that Israel is not part of the Rome Statute and has not signed on this treaty and uh, more so has, uh, 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 not provided its legitimacy when it comes to uh, variables cons uh, when uh, with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But, uh, Ms. Lear, I'd like to uh, touch base, base on the element of using international mechanisms within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To what degree uh, has this become a, a uh, resort or a last resort for the Palestinians, uh, considering the fact that they know they're not strong enough to beat Israel in other platforms. Well, following on from what Mr. Oren said, the Palestinians certainly see themselves as the weaker partner, if one can say that, in this conflict. And so their appeal to international organizations is to really 
and this is what Israelis would argue, is to try and bypass perhaps direct negotiations, get themselves legitimacy on the international stage by becoming fully fledged members of these of these particularly United Nations organizations. Now the problem and this is the argument again put forward by the Israelis, is that that should happen after you've had negotiations and after you've sorted out the conflict. Let's then look at the Palestinians becoming a fully fledged member of the United Nations and having that kind of international standing, but not before. The fact that the Palestinians are doing it the other way around shows a frustration on their side, shows that they feel that the conflict as it stands is not achieving any kind of progress, particularly not in the direction they want to go. And so they essentially trying to speed up the whole process. But there are problems with turning to international organizations. If we look at something like the United Nations, obviously the Israelis feel that it's biased against them. The Palestinians feel that the United States, which very often has taken the role of the United Nations in mediating between the sides, is biased against them. You also have a problem with the United Nations in terms of its architecture. It was set up after the Second World War to deal with global conflicts. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a regional conflict, one could say, or it's kind of a proxy war. And the question needs to be asked whether the United Nations can actually deal with those kind of conflicts. Mr. Owen? Uh, there are problems with uh, international organizations which were supposed to be um, holes uh, rather than a mere sum of their parts, but uh, turned out uh, to be almost redundant when one looks at the bilateral relations between the uh, most important member states and Israel or Palestine. Because uh, obviously, if the United States wants to deal with Israel or Palestine or any other country, it can bypass the international organization, especially since it has veto power over um, uh, its uh, resolutions. Uh, and this also holds true uh, to other international organizations, which are not global in scale, such as NATO or the European Union. And uh, there was a time right after the uh, creation of the United Nations in 1945, and perhaps th through the 50s, where the UN staff, we have been talking about the member states, but there is also the staff uh, headed by a secretary general. It used to be quite strong. Then in 1967, it turned out that it was too strong that the Secretary General, Uthant, uh, made uh, his decision without consulting the Security Council regarding the eviction of the UN Emergency Force from the Sinai and Sharm el-Sheikh. This gave rise to the crisis which then led to the occupation of the territories. So the uh, uh, big powers, the big five, permanent five, took away the powers of the Secretary General, and now it is only they, rather than the, the succession of Secretary General and their undersecretaries who count. And uh, one more point regarding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We have what is called the Quartet, which is the United States, Russia, the UN, and the EU. And this is supposed to be a mechanism which crystallizes world public opinion because most major powers are represented uh, there. But we haven't seen real progress uh, in the conflict ever since the quartet was established um, early in the last decade. Dr. Mudrik Evenchen, to what degree do the international uh, mechanisms actually apply to regions that do not recognize its uh, appliance uh, as uh, uh, one point and another element to it, to what degree does, uh, do those mechanisms actually provide uh, a cover or legitimacy to various parties? Um, what do you mean regions that do not? Uh, For instance, like, Israel does not recognize the International least. Criminal Court, but uh, the International Criminal Court does recognize uh, the Palestinian entity which has signed the Rome Statute. Yes. Uh, well, yes, sometimes it, it I mean, uh, the cooperation with these mechanisms doesn't require uh, um, indeed cooperation because, for, inst uh, for instance, the Rome Statute uh, has, uh, um, um, uh, can apply uh, its jurisdiction uh, in territories uh, that do uh, accept its jurisdiction. So, for instance, if Israel did not uh, uh, comply with its jurisdiction then, and the Palestinian Authority does, then, then it could... Um, uh, apply its jurisdiction over there, 
while on Israelis, because if you think about Israelis operating over there, then the uh, the, the ICC could uh, apply its jurisdiction over Israelis. Uh, the thing is that Israel would not cooperate with the court in, uh, with its investigations, whether uh, the office of the prosecutor would like to enter Israel, uh, to yeah, to enter Israel and to investigate and to question uh, those suspects, and perhaps Israel would not. Uh, cooperate with this mechanism, but I think there this is still far away because we we see that uh, the the prosecutor has only started a preliminary investigation and it does not really uh, go on with this. I think the ICC has other problems in Africa and in other places in the world where it is still working on, and and I'm not sure that its intervention uh, within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is soon to come. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are other mechanisms, uh, such as the uh, Human Rights Council, uh, which is very active uh, in its decisions uh, and, and investigations against Israel. And there has been a couple since uh, uh, 2008 uh, with the, um, the, the Goldstone uh, mechanism or the Goldstone report and then the McGowan uh, uh, committee in 2014, and now uh, uh, the prosecutor Fatou, Fatou Ben Souda said that um, um, no, the prosecutor of the ICC, sorry, but uh, now the, the committee again again uh, decided uh, the council, not the committee, sorry, decided to open an investigation mm -hmm. uh, with regards to those events at the uh, southern border in Gaza. Which brings me to uh, the next question, Ms. Lear. When we're talking about the uh, uh, Human Rights Council, the HCR, it had uh, not the most positive track record when uh, deciding uh, which uh, conflict or which uh, alleged atrocities to investigate, uh, putting Israel at the forefront of pretty much 90%, if not more, of all its investigations and all of its resolutions, how can such an organization receive legitimacy considering the fact that all it focuses on is by our, uh, countries that are committing atrocities themselves and then move forward to accuse Israel for various things that they claim are not conducted within the international community's uh, uh, right way of doing things? Well, that would be exactly the Israeli argument. They don't feel it has any legitimacy. They would say that there's an undue amount of attention that's placed on Israel. You have, for example, in the last session that was held back in March, I think there were three resolutions that were passed against Israel. There was one against North Korea, one against Iran, and two against Syria. And there were none um, and no discussion held against human rights abuses in countries like China, um, Zimbabwe, the United Arab Emirates. So Israel would argue exactly that, that there's a disproportionate amount of attention and negative attention that's placed on it. Now, following the Gaza war, what we see happening is a resolution being passed for an an international investigation to take place into Israel's actions during the last Gaza war. Following on from you, what you mentioned, it's, Israel's not going to potentially give them entry into Israel, is not going to give them any kind of assistance because they feel that any kind of investigation carried out by the Human Rights Commission is biased already in terms of what it's looking for and is not mm -hmm. going to try and perceive both sides of the story. So. Israel feels that these kind of organizations are biased to begin with. Palestinians push for them because they feel that it's the only way that they can get some kind of recourse. Mr. Owen? International organizations, um, with the uh, ICC supposedly an exception because it is uh, judicial, but uh, actually it is no exception. International organizations are based on a parliamentary system, which means that if you can uh, gain a majority of votes, you are more powerful than the other guy, the other state. So, yes, Israel does have the United States uh, backing it, and it is important. But when uh, the uh, vote is not in the Security Council, where you can veto, but in the General Assembly, uh, which is less binding, but uh, regarding public opinion worldwide is also important, then Israel uh, would also lose. So the solution is uh, similar to what the United States did regarding the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, a coalition of the willing, bypassing the established organizations and going to uh, states uh, which are willing to do something somewhere. For instance, the donor countries regarding Gaza or the Palestinian community in general following the Oslo Agreement. So we see that um, after Operation Protective Edge four years ago, 
the donor countries uh, have decided to put more money into uh, the reconstruction of Gaza. And this had nothing to do with either the UN or any other international body. Uh, Dr. Uri Modric Evenchen, when we're talking about those international mechanisms, just lately we had the presidency of Syria, uh, for instance, at the UN uh, in Geneva, uh, where uh, they uh, assumed the role of presidency over the Conference of Disarmament, an organization that just several weeks prior has uh, uh, passed a resolution condemning Syria for the use of chemical weapons. Aren't any mechanisms in place that would bring about some kind of a reality that those kind of absurd uh, appointments are not made? No, oh, this is a major problem. And as long as the UN is in its composition and this is its statute and the P5 controlling it and they only have the, the power to change uh, the, the, the charter of the UN, then this would be so. Uh, in, the, in the Human Rights Commission, you can see Saudi Arabia chairing the Commission uh, of Human Rights. And, 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 and perhaps uh, Prince uh, bin Salman would change something. Well, not in the very near future, but of course we know the problem with, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the fact that Saudi Arabia, Arabia is not really a state that is protecting human rights. And, and, and if this country could be a chair of, the, of this commission, then I think it says everything. And this is also the problem with other uh, uh, committees in the U.S. But it is a more general uh, problem regarding the haves and the have-nots and those in between. Um, you see countries such as Brazil and Turkey and perhaps Iran uh, and Germany um, going for a permanent seat in the Security Council. Uh, they want uh, to be at least in a business class, if not first class. Mm -hmm but not, not um, in economy. And the same goes for the uh, NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, where uh, those uh, powers who already had nuclear weapons gained a certain status, and others were relegated to, to second-class uh, status, and uh, they don't like it. But well, as you said, Mr. Oren, and I'd like to ask this to, uh, to uh, Ms. Lear, when we're talking about public opinion, there is some kind of influence uh, being applied by those various mechanisms in order to steer public opinion in the favor of one or the other. Now, obviously, there are problems with different countries assuming roles within organizations that, by the definition of their basic values, contradicts one another. To what degree is those uh, are those uh, countries using those mechanisms for uh, cynical use in order to try and dissuade international public opinion to their favor. I mean, I think you could argue that that is happening. I mean, just following on from your example, if Saudi Arabia is the chairman of the United Nations Human Rights Council, it perhaps helps them not have international attention drawn at their own human rights record. Having said that, though, if you look at Israel always on the negative receiving end of the Human Rights Commission and other UN bodies, on the ground, for example, this international commission that's going to come and investigate how Israel behaved in the most recent uh, flare-up on violence on the Gaza border. On the ground, it doesn't really matter practically what that investigation finds out. It's not really going to have dire consequences for Israel. But in terms of what it does for Israeli diplomacy, in terms of what it does for Israeli reputation, and the perception of how Israel behaved in the international community is quite damaging. And it points also to the fact that that inquiry wants to attain individual responsibility to Israeli soldiers, Israeli commandos, and that could way, pave the way for potential lawsuits happening in the international criminal court. So Israel might say, we don't recognize the Human Rights Commission, we're not party to the international criminal court. But as was mentioned earlier, it doesn't absolve Israel of not finding itself on the receiving end of investigations if they happen by the ICC, landing up pointing fingers at them. There's one more point I want to make. And that is that one of the problems with these international organizations is that you need local buy-in. When the partition of Palestine happened in 1947 by the United Nations, that was perhaps the first indication that the UN is not the ideal party in terms of addressing the conflict because your local Palestinians and your Arab states did not buy into that partition. And so you had this flare-up in violence. Today, Israel doesn't buy in to what the United Nations is proposing either. So for as long as the, the Israelis and the Palestinians are not buying in to watch the, into what these international organizations 
organizations are trying to, or at least say they're trying to achieve, you have a real problem. And then it begs the question of how can these international mechanisms actually create peace between the sides? Mr. Owen. But, but Paula is, is definitely right regarding the erosion in Israel's uh, perception worldwide. It is gradually becoming a pariah state, it, unjustly. Um, Israel, uh, Israel's behavior um, is not, uh, uh, le is not uh, less uh, human or, or less gentlemanly than any other countries. But nevertheless, this is the image which is being projected and international organizations uh, give rise to it. The uh, byproduct is that certain organizations um, on American campuses or European labor unions take action later to boycott Israel. For instance, if you have longshoremen on, in a certain European harbor and they refuse to uh, take Israeli products off the ship or ammunition destined to Israel and put it on a ship to Israel, then Israel suffers. Dr. Mudrik Evenchen, to what degree do the uh, organizations that uh, are continually condemning Israel for various uh, uh, reasons actually receive scrutiny of their own for the manner of conduct and the various uh, uh, choices that they are making? Not so much as was just said here. Uh, they they are successful in creating this image that Israel is uh, is um, uh, um, does not apply to international law and keeps violating it. And this is a, a wrongful image, but they they are successful in uh, creating it. And perhaps what Israel should have done is instead of. Uh, uh, fending off all the initiatives and all the efforts that those mechanisms are making, despite the fact that they are not uh, successful, uh, it should have been more cooperative with them. And then it could have uh, perhaps been successful in uh, in trying to change this image that these mechanisms are this is This it. is what happened with the Goldstone report mm -hmm. some eight years ago. Initially, the Israeli reaction was negative. We are not going to cooperate. Then they thought uh, better about it and said, we have nothing to hide. Come and over. Then he changed his mind, but uh, right. it does not keep happening. They are, I mean, Israel keeps fending off um, all, all of the... Uh, well, can yeah, Israel yeah. participate in an organization that houses uh, a list of uh, countries that call for its annihilation? No. Uh, well, uh, Israel is still a member of the UN, so obviously. it should, yes, obviously. So it should try to influence from, from inside and not from the outside and make efforts to change uh, or, or to have... Um, but the only problem with that is that you give legitimacy to an organization or to an investigation or to an effort that the Israelis would argue tries to delegitimize you. So it's a very difficult question. Do you participate in something that you believe from the beginning is already biased and is anti-you? The moment you have such an organization that continually condemns you, nevertheless, that your ability to influence it uh, is limited because uh, you have a list of Yemen, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, I can continue naming all those countries, but obviously the list doesn't become any better. Those countries openly seek a confrontation with the state of Israel, of course, excluding some moderate Arab states now that have shifted because of their concerns with regard to the Islamic Republic of Iran. But to what degree can you influence such an organization considering this fact? So, so many Israelis would argue that you can't. So that would be the argument for actually just not recognizing it, not participating in it. However, there's another argument that you could look at, it's not only those countries that make up, for example, the United Nations. So, for example, in the last two years, Netanyahu has been paying a lot of attention to Africa. If he can kind of bring the African states to vote as a bloc and be supportive of Israel, that could be a step in the right direction as far as the Israelis are concerned in terms of how they're perceived and the kind of support they get at organizations like the, the United Nations. And it's not just Africa, it's your Eastern countries, it's, it's in Year, it's China. So perhaps Israel needs to be focusing less on, on Arab countries per se and shifting its attention, which is what it's doing on, on, on different parts of the world. We haven't seen any evidence uh, for Netanyahu's success on that. Even India 
uh, with Modi being Netanyahu's best friend uh, globally, votes against Israel or at most uh, abstains. But but the um, flaw in the United Nations uh, from its inception was the naive beginning that there is something called world public opinion regarding world peace because it was built um, in order to learn from the lesson of the failure of the League of Nations before World War II and uh, to try and uh, find some fire break be uh, before a local conflict becomes global. There was this belief that uh, uh, member states can get together and stop uh, local conflicts. And um, very soon, because of the Cold War, it turned out that the world is divided into camps and um, it is not the merit of the specific conflict which is being discussed, by the, but the membership in uh, this uh, camp, be it American or Soviet. So, so it is really futile to try and refer the conflict to the U.S. So why preserve such an organization that obviously is condemned by the United States, by Russia, by Turkey, by so many countries, except by some EU member be states that uh, uh, hail this organization as a cornerstone of light? Because it is better than having no organization and because it does have some power, perhaps a deterrent power, regarding its sanctions. When it does get together, and when it uh, uh, puts sanctions on a certain country, such as apartheid South Africa, it gets results. Well, uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you a closing statement. Dr. Mudley, Kevin Chen, we'll start with you. Okay. I wanted to note maybe something that has not been said here uh, uh, regarding the fact that uh, the, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinians are divided also because there is Hamas uh, in Gaza and there is the Palestinian Authority on the West Bank. And so this is also a question. How, to, to what extent should Hamas uh, be involved in, the, in, in those uh, uh, processes? Um, uh, and of course, it cannot be a member of the, I mean, it cannot even uh, be any part of the UN because the UN only accepts the, the, the Palestinian Authority. But this is also a question because now the main uh, conflict is with Hamas. So. As far as I remember, in the mid-2000s, Hamas won the election in the Palestinian Authority. Ms. Lear? I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that the, as far as the Palestinians are concerned, we speak a lot about Israel's not seeing the United Nations as being an objective body that can bring about peace. But the Palestinians actually don't trust the Israelis. We have direct talks that are not happening. So the, a lot of it's also coming out of the frustration from the Palestinian side. It's all very well to criticize, as we've done quite successfully, these international mechanisms. But back to your question, well, if it wasn't for the United Nations, what would there be? If it wasn't for these international mechanisms, as faulty as they are, where would the Palestinians be able to take their addresses, largely because they feel they don't have a partner in the Mr. Israelis? Mr. Owen, closing say, uh, sentence? Yes, and if... Um eventually there is a peace formula achieved, it is very important to legitimize it by the UN so that the Palestinian diaspora, the refugees and their descendants know that this is the maximum they could have gotten. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Dr. Mudri Kevin Chen, Mr. Owen, and Ms. Lear, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.